Let's turn to our scripture reading today, which comes from John 15. It's a very different context in a way than uh, Isaiah 41. In Isaiah 41, Israel is is, uh, being told she's going to go into exile and God's saying, I'm going to be with you. Here, in John 15, there is a sense of return from exile. Christ is going to be bringing in the kingdom and the disciples are going to be in that kingdom. But at the same time, Jesus is going to be sending them out into the world, sending them out into Babylon, so that Babylon may be transformed. And Jesus strengthens them with his words in John 15. I am the true vine, and my father is the vine dresser. Every branch in me that does not bear fruit, he takes away, and every branch that does bear fruit, he prunes, that it may, be, that it may bear more fruit. Already you are clean because of the word that I have spoken to you. Abide in me, and I in you, as the branch cannot bear fruit by itself. Unless it abides in the vine, neither can you, unless you abide in me. I am the vine, you are the branches. Whoever abides in me, and I in him, he it is who bears much fruit. For apart from me, you can do nothing. If anyone does not abide in me, he is thrown away like a branch and withers, and the branches are gathered, thrown into the fire, and burned. If you abide in me, and my words abide in you, ask whatever you wish, and it will be done for you. By this my Father is glorified, that you bear much fruit, and so prove to be my disciples. As the Father has loved me, so have I loved you. Abide in my love. If you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love, just as I have kept my Father's commandments and abide in his love. These things I have spoken to you, that my joy may be in you, and that your joy may be full. This is my commandment, that you love one another as I have loved you. Greater love has no one than this, than that someone lay down his life for his friends. You are my friends if you do what I command you. No longer do I call you servants, For the servant does not know what his master is doing, but I have called you friends. For all that I have heard from my father, I have made known to you. You did not choose me, but I chose you and appointed you that you should go and bear fruit and that your fruit should abide, so that whatever you ask the father in my name, he may give it to you. These things I command you so that you will love one another. If the world hates you, you know that it, it has hated me before it hated you. If you were of the world, the world would love you as its own. But because you are not of the world, but I chose you out of the world, therefore the world hates you. Remember the word that I said to you, a servant is not greater than his master. If they persecuted me, they will also persecute you. If they kept my word, they will also keep yours. But all these things they will do to you on account of my name, because they do not know him who sent me. If I had not come and spoken to them, they would not have been guilty of sin. But now they have no excuse for their sin. Whoever hates me hates my father also. If I had not done among them the works that no one else did, they would not be guilty of sin. But now they have seen and hated both me and my father." But the word that is written in their law must be fulfilled. They hated me without a cause. But when the Helper comes, whom I will send to you from the Father, the Spirit of truth who proceeds from the Father, he will bear witness about me. And you also will bear witness, because you have been with me from the beginning. Let's now turn in our Bibles to Isaiah 41. We'll be reading the first 20 verses, and we'll be focusing today on verse 10. Our text will be verse 10. Isaiah 41. Listen to me in silence, O coastlands. Let the peoples renew their strength. Let them approach, then let them speak. Let us together draw near for judgment. Who stirred up one from the east whom victory meets at every step? 
He gives up nations before him so that he tramples kings underfoot. He makes them like dust with his sword, like driven stubble with his bow. He pursues them and passes on safely by paths his feet have not trod. Who has performed and done this, calling the generations from the beginning? I, the Lord, the first and with the last, I am he. The coastlands have seen and are afraid. The ends of the earth tremble, they have drawn near and come. Everyone helps his neighbor and says to his brother, be strong. The craftsman strengthens the goldsmith, and he who smooths with the hammer, him who strikes the anvil, saying of the soldering, it is good, and they strengthen it with nails so that it cannot be moved. But you, Israel, my servant, Jacob, whom I have chosen, the offspring of Abraham, my friend, you whom I took from the ends of the earth and called from its farthest corners, saying to you, you are my servant. I have chosen you and not cast you off. Fear not, for I am with you. Be not dismayed, for I am your God. I will strengthen you. I will help you. I will uphold you with my righteous right hand. Behold, all who are incensed against you shall be put to shame and confounded. Those who strive against you shall be as nothing and shall perish. You shall seek those who contend with you, but you shall not find them. Those who war against you shall be as nothing at all. For I, the Lord your God, hold your right hand. It is I who say to you, fear not, I am the one who helps you. Fear not, you worm Jacob, you men of Israel. I am the one who helps you, declares the Lord. Your Redeemer is the Holy One of Israel. Behold, I make of you a threshing sledge, new, sharp, and having teeth. You shall thresh the mountains and crush them, and you shall make the hills like chaff. You shall winnow them, and the wind shall carry them away, and the tempest shall scatter them. And you shall rejoice in the Lord, and the Holy One of Israel you shall glory. When the poor and needy seek water and there is none and their tongue is parched with thirst, I, the Lord, will answer them. I, the God of Israel, will not forsake them. I will open rivers on the bare heights and fountains in the midst of the valleys. I will make the wilderness a pool of water and the dry land springs of water. I will put in the wilderness the cedar, the acacia, the myrtle, and the olive. I will set in the desert the cypress, the plain, and the pine together that they may see and know, may consider and understand together that the hand of the Lord has done this. The Holy One of Israel has created it. And let's look back at verse 10 for a moment. Fear not, for I am with you. Be not dismayed, for I am your God. I will strengthen you. I will help you. I will uphold you with my righteous right hand. So far, the reading of God's word. Beloved in the Lord, the book of Isaiah is given to an Israel who is in a deeply pitiable position. She's surrounded by enemies. She's under judgment her temple will be broken down and she will be taken into exile. We see that in our passage. The, the God is stirring up something in the east that is going to destroy the nations. But as she looks in, around and wonders at her place, the Lord reminds her of her election. I have chosen you. You are my servant. That's the basis for his reminder to Israel, fear not. The servant, God's servant, Israel is a type of servant of the servant who is to come. The servant who will bear our iniquities and the servant who will go, to the lamb, uh, go as a lamb to the slaughter. God came to this servant and, and gave him this same promise. I have chosen you. I will help you. All who come to him have that same promise. We, after all, are baptized into the name of that servant. 
that servant who is God with us. And knowing that he is with us, we too can be confident. Even as Israel enters death and resurrection with this promise in our passage, a death going into exile and then restored in the return from exile. So even as Israel entered death and resurrection with this promise, we, in the darkness that we experience, have this promise too. We approach various types of death in our lives with the knowledge that God has chosen us and is with us to strengthen us so that we come through to the other side. There will be a return from exile. There will be resurrection. There will be an entrance into the joy of the new creation. God comforts and strengthens us so that we will make it to the other side of whatever hardships he may have in store for us. So I bring you the word of the Lord under the theme, God helps his servant. First, we're going to see comfort, comfort for the situation, comfort as we go into the valley. And second, courage. God strengthens us for whatever he calls us to go through. At a certain point, Judah and Israel knew that they had to go into exile. They had to be removed from the land that the Lord had planted them and brought to a new land. Those who continued to hear the word of the Lord and love his promise were called to accept the coming exile. God had declared that he was using this exile to cleanse his people. Those who desired what the Lord desired, those who were sad at the state of Jerusalem and the evil deeds that she had piled up to heaven, were to find hope in what the Lord was doing through the Babylonian king, Nebuchadnezzar. It's a strange person for Israel to be called to put their hope in, a strange people for Israel to find hope in. While the nations around Israel have much to fear, as does unbelieving Israel, the true Israel, the remnant, those who trust in God, can know that God is with them. They will experience the same pain that their fellow men will experience in the conquest of the nations and the destruction of their homeland. However, they do so with one distinct advantage. They know that they are chosen by God for a purpose. They know that if they trust in him, if they keep in the front of their minds, God is king, God is in control of what is happening. And if I can believe his promises, then they can know that they will come to the other end. They will experience the joy of the resurrection and the new life. God reminds Israel of what he has done for her, how he took her from among the nations and made her his own. Based on his love and faithfulness toward Israel and Jacob and Abraham, he tells her, fear not, for I am with you. Fear not, for I am with you. Israel has every reason to be afraid as she goes into exile. Will she lose her special place in God's mind? Isn't the destruction of her homeland and particularly the destruction of the temple a sign that God no longer loved her? No, says God, my promises are bigger than what you can see here on earth. My promises are bigger than the good things that I have established even. Right? The temple was a good thing. Israel in the land of, of uh, Israel being put into the promised land, that's a good thing. God established those things. But God says, my promises are bigger than those things. Even when things fall apart, my promises remain because I am who I am. So do not fear. God says that to Abraham. 
God says that to Israel in the wilderness. God says that to Joshua as he's about to conquer the land of the promised land. God says that to David. And through his word, Jesus Christ, God says that to his disciples as they talk in the upper room. Don't be afraid when the world hates you. You have no reason to be afraid. Why? Because I am with you. And that means I am for you. Do not be dismayed, says God. I am your God. Yours. That doesn't mean you can control what God can do. If that were true, that the fact that he is your God would be meaningless. It means that he is for you. He has given himself to you in whatever situation. He will be faithful to you. If you stray, he will call you back. If you suffer, he will remember you. So when you approach the valley of the shadow of death, you do not need to be afraid. Of course, we are afraid. That's why God gives us this teaching here. That's why we're told it so often throughout Scripture. Do not fear. It's not even necessarily wrong to have some fear. There's a difference between feeling fear and acting on that feeling. Between the feeling of fear and giving into it. For believing Judeans at the time of Nebuchadnezzar's conquest of Jerusalem, there was certainly a great deal of uncertainty. There was great sadness as their homeland burned. But in that, they knew they did not need to flee because God was with them. They did not need to despair because God was with them. It's the same courage that ignites Jesus' heart in his ministry. Jesus feels fear of the cross. But he doesn't give in to that fear. He doesn't run away from it. He accepts the will of God in going to the cross. He's the chosen servant of God. He knows that he must go through the cross. That's his calling. He knows that he must be obedient to God even to death. And in him, we have the same promise. Jacob and Abraham are ultimately chosen in Christ. And all those brought into the church of God have the same promise. God says, Christ is my chosen one. You have believed in him, and in him I am with you. My spirit will dwell in you and comfort you as you walk in my ways and my paths. That's the promise Christ gives to his disciples in the upper room. If you serve me, the world will hate you, but I will be with you. In fact, I'm giving you the Holy Spirit so that you can be strong for the sake of my kingdom. That's the important part here. These promises are not just given to anybody. They are given to those who have put their faith in Christ, that have been baptized into him. Even those who have forgotten their baptisms may be confident returning to Christ. He's always there, ready to receive you, ready to receive Israel. That's how these words given to Israel 2,500 years ago are also given to us. So when we go into various trials, we don't need to fear. Various diseases come upon us as a surprise. It's scary, but we don't need to lose ourselves in despair because we are chosen by God. We see that in God's care in our lives. We see that in baptism. We're connected to Christ, the chosen one. You have the Spirit, the Comforter, the Spirit who is God with us, encouraging you as you approach these trials. Don't be afraid. It's not only the physical trials, but even bigger in Isaiah 41, in John 15. It's the hatred of the world. Jesus warns his disciples, if you love me, if you're full of my light, the world will hate you. 
For the faithful Jew in the time of Isaiah was no different. Other Jews, according to the flesh, may have hated him. Many nations around Judea saw the weakness of Judea as an opportunity to take revenge on the Jews. For impressionable people like us, it's easy to start to think that the hatred of the world means that God no longer cares for us. That's why God encourages disciples, and that's why he encourages us with the knowledge that the world will hate us. But even in that, we can be confident that we are chosen by God. God promised that he would bring the nations that are incensed with and contend with Israel to nothing. Because even though Israel has sinned, God loves Israel according to his marvelous grace. That sin too brings out the marvel of what is going on here. Even though Israel sinned, God will still be with her because he chose her. That's the same certainty we can have when we look to Christ. God took our sin and punished it through his sacrifice so that whatever difficulties we are brought into, we can know that God is with us. No matter what it might be like at the, at the given moment, we can know that those who are incensed, those who are at war with the church of Christ, will come to nothing. God does more than comfort us, though. He comes and he equips us with what we need to live before him. And that brings us to our second point, courage. God does not command us to live courageously without supplying us with what we need to live courageously. I will strengthen you. I will help you. I will uphold you with my righteous right hand. This is simply what God does. Even before sin came into the world, God gave Adam and Eve everything they needed to live in righteousness and holiness before him. We depend on God for our very being. It's the same with us. God gives us everything we need so that we do not act on the fear that often rises within us. When hard things come into our lives, we can respond with bitterness. We can respond with hatred. We can respond with greed. We often seek to protect ourselves at the expense of doing what is right. But in Christ, in the knowledge of what he did for us and the freedom he gives us, we can respond with courage. And again, that doesn't mean there's no feelings of fear. That doesn't mean that, there's, that, uh, that we can't be afraid on the inside. That courage means that we continue to serve God in the midst of the trial. The fortitude to come through this trial that the Lord gives us. John 15 gives us a prime example. The disciples gathered around Christ may well have despaired when the good message they received and the good deeds they performed were responded to with hatred. They may have responded to their fear by giving in to rage. Or they might have responded to their fear by seeking to appease. Both attitudes don't represent the fact that Christ had just promised them his Holy Spirit. Rather, by knowing that God is with them, despite their weakness, despite remaining sin, they can be confident to continue to shine the light of Christ even as they receive the hatred of the world. It's the same for any trouble we might receive. In our individual lives, we deal with sickness. We deal with depression and anxiety. We deal with hardships from family and those we might have once considered friends. And God comes to you and says, you are mine. 
I will strengthen you. That doesn't mean your friends will suddenly reconcile with you or your family will suddenly love you or the problems will disappear. That means that God will give you what you need to get through that moment. And he gives you the strength and the courage to do what needs to be done in the moment of hardship. When you are sick, you don't just give up and die. You go to the doctor, you seek to get well, and you make sure that the things you are responsible for are taken care of. God gives you the strength to do what you need to do in the given moment. Of course, in this, we must remember that God knows what we need, not us. God gives you a church to strengthen you in the given moment. And sometimes that's something that can be ignored. The means that God gives us to strengthen, to help, and to hold our hands. It's the church. It's our brothers and sisters. It's, it's not just the strength of mind and character that God gives some of us. Some people are stronger, some people are weaker, and God gives us the necessary individual strengths. But God also puts strong people in our lives that we can rely on if we're willing to do that. Sometimes people will complain that I have no help when our life is full of resources. You, the point is, you are God's gift of strength to one another. It's the same when the world hates the church. We don't get scared and hide our light. We don't need to shut up when the world doesn't like parts of the righteousness of God. We can continue to proclaim Christ and his righteousness and practice that righteousness. And God will strengthen us when the world stands against us and seeks to destroy us. And similarly, with our individual troubles, God uses other members of the church to strengthen us in our faith when the world hates us. Not only will he strengthen us, but he will hold us with his righteous hand. This suggests the closeness and the intimacy of what God is doing in granting us salvation. This suggests his love and deep care for us, that he will not let us go. One of the most encouraging things in all of this, however, is that this goes beyond that God, this goes beyond the moment of suffering. God did not make us for suffering. God did not make us for hardship and troubles. He made us for joy and fellowship and worship and building and dominion. He is with us in our troubles, assuring us that there is joy on the other end that will far outweigh those troubles. Job's wife, if you remember the story of, of Job, Job's wife, when Job came into trouble, told Job it wasn't worth it. Curse God and die, she said. It's better to give up and be rid of the trouble. It's better to hide. That's not God's teaching. I am your protection, says God, through the valleys of this life. Job believed that, and he was rewarded with a better life after his suffering than before his suffering. God always comforts us with something better that is coming from our reading. When the poor and needy seek water and there is none, and their tongue is parched with thirst, I, the Lord, will answer them. I will not forsake them. I will open rivers on the bare heights and fountains in the midst of the valleys. One of the lessons of baptism is the promise that the Lord is never without water. That's what the Lord tells a Samaritan woman in John 4. I will give you water so that you will never thirst again. The Lord promises to wash us by his blood, to forgive us our sins, and he also gives us the spirit with the promise of eternal, eternal life. There is an end to it all, and that is our eternal life in God. At the end of our reading in Isaiah 41, the Lord describes the creation of an oasis of pools of water and trees in the wilderness. The focus is on the comfort and care for his people on earth. Even in the wilderness, God gives us places of, 
of uh, safety, but that also looks forward to the certainty we have in joining our God in the feast of the Lamb. All glory be to God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. Amen.